Have you ever wondered about your personality type? You know, each of us have different dominant genes, so to speak, dominant char- characteristics. But we don't always have a handle exactly what type are we. Is it healthy? Is it not healthy? Is it shaped by our parents and educators and society? Or is it inherent? How do we harness our strengths? How do we maximize our potential and minimize the pitfalls or the drawbacks that each character type may have? That's what we will be discussing in this four-part course, which is identifying these four archetypes. So this goes back thousands of years of how scientists looked at the universe, the chemistry of the universe. So even though today the four elements may not be seen quite the same way, but the archetypes of these four components is extremely relevant when you really put it into terms that we can all relate to. And uh, so we will be covering all of them today. We will be covering part one, the Kabbalah of fire. So like all the other elements, fire is a part of our lives. It has its strengths, it has its uh, challenges, its virtues and its vices. So when you hear the word fire, what does it conjure up? So for many, it conjures up the word danger. Fire you know, drives panic in us. When a fire breaks out, it's out of control. But fire also has the element of passion. Now passion, too, has a positive side and a negative side. So that's what we're going to be addressing. And most importantly, making it relevant to ourselves. So we're not just talking about the chemistry of it or the science of it, but the relevance, the archetype. What is an archetype? An archetype is a type of template. It is a quintessential feature. So all of us have all four elements within us. We have the fire within us, we have the wind within us, we have the water within us, and we have the earth within us. But they're still dominant elements. So fire. The way it's described... When you talk about the features, the very feature of fire, it's described as fire being dry and hot. All four elements have a different combination of that. Two of them are dry. One is dry and hot, and there's dry and cold. And the second is cold or warm. So fire is dry and hot. Wind, as we will discuss, is dry and cold. Water is moist, is wet and cold, and earth is dry and and warm. These will be the four features. So when we talk about fire, the first thing we need to know is the fire within us, the fire in our belly, the fire in our soul, is a very healthy thing. But like all fire, if it's harnessed properly, we use it well. When it's not, it can be destructive. So think of passion. All of us have passion. Now passion can, we know, can be extremely powerful, a powerful force in love, in relationships, in commitment. You're excited, you're passionate. You feel that fire burning. You're not complacent. So in that sense, yes, it's a hot element. It's dry because it's not moist. And that causes it to be a very strong force in our lives. And as such, what it does is it drives us. What we need to be, what we need to hold in check is to make sure that the fire does not consume us. Because if it consumes us, it becomes obsessive and it can become destructive to ourselves and to others. So there's also what we'll call foreign fire, alien fire. Sometimes that was a, uh, a, a description describing destructive sub- substances. So yes, it's fire. And there's a lot of passion in it, but it can be a passion that's misdirected. Look what happens with crimes of passion. People lose their minds, and they can really hurt someone. They can kill someone in the, in the throes of passion. So what do we, how do we look at this fiery part of, us, of, of ourselves? So if you're a passionate person, you know immediately both the positives and the negatives. Passion leads to, as I said, drive and building things. But on the other hand, passion needs to be checked. So how do we check passion? We need objectivity to determine where that fire is being used and how it's being used. If it's controlling you or it does not have any discipline at all, 
it will most likely end up hurting somebody. If, however, it's harnessed, exactly like we look at fire, we need, we need warmth on this earth. We need fire in our homes to warm food, to cook food, to keep ourselves warm and healthy. The human body has a certain temperature. If it gets too low, it's not good. We need to have warmth. Our blood has to be a certain warmth. However, if it gets too hot, we call that fever. We call that becoming dangerous if it gets too hot. So that measure is the key. In our personal lives, the best possible way to maintain balance in that area is to make sure that you have someone you speak to that can review the fire within you. Now, as I mentioned, not everybody is a fiery personality. Some are very passionate people. Some are not. But everybody needs passion. Everybody needs fire in their lives. We'll soon discuss the deeper elements of it. But I just wanted to begin on a very basic level. So let's start with this. Write down for yourself. Do you feel you're a passionate person? So then we can say you have the element of fire within you functioning. Do you feel that you have passion, but you don't have the right and ability to express it? It may have been suppressed. It may have been mocked. It may have been some ways criticized. So you've, you've learned to just control yourself. So then we may, we may have a fire within you that's waiting to express itself, but it's not fully expressed. So this is important to document this. You want to evaluate yourself first. So question number one, are you a passionate type of person? Question number two, do you have passion that has not been released? Question number three, if you are a passionate person, where do those passions lie? Describe three things you're passionate about. This is awareness. This is what's called the first step in all growth is knowing. Self-awareness. Knowing yourself. Know thyself. That helps you identify. Very often, most of our personality types and characteristics are more impulsive. They come when they come and they go when they go. What we're trying to do here is be more deliberate, to really look at it and identify it, because then you get much more control of it, and you can then also maximize it and minimize any of the negatives, negative traits that it may produce. So those are the first obvious questions that are necessary to just assess yourself. Now, if your answer is, I'm not that passionate type of person, I would still suggest, is there anything that you're passionate about, anything that riles you up? It could be protecting your family. It could be certain values that you feel are, tr- are tr- trod- uh, trodden upon by others or dismissed by others. Things that make, you, make, make your blood boil. Yeah, the word fire, boil. It's things that make you upset. Now again, there's two directions here. If, for example, you get upset about things that are positive things, that's good. If you get upset about petty things and nonsense, that's not good. So then let me introduce you now to the next step, which is the features. What are the character features of fire in our lives? So the first I mentioned was passion. <clears throat> and passion can go in both directions, as I said. But there's two others that are, we're talking on the, we're gonna, I'm going to mention some positive elements and some negative ones. The positive ones is passion, a healthy passion, something that you really believe in and that you, yes, makes your blood boil in a good way because you believe in it. You're not neutral, you're not ambiguous. And you really believe in something, which can be categorized under the category of passion. And other positive things of fire is the, the drive that it brings, love, that you do things with a type of excitement. What about the negative side? The negative side are usually classified into two. One is, of course, anger. Anger is fire. Fiery anger, fiery rage. It's a fiery element. It's dry and hot. That's what it is. And as such, it's a force that can be very dangerous. We know what anger can do. When people get angry, they get out of control. Like a fire, they consume themselves and others. Things that bother you to the point that they eat you up alive. Talk about being your blood boiling. It could be boiling for the wrong reasons. (coughs) It can go into areas of, of resentment. Anything that elicits anger would be, we would call that the negative manifestation of fire. Another negative manifestation is, interestingly, is some of the mystics identify it with arrogance. Why? Because like fire rises, arrogance is a type of a rising sense, a sense of inflated ego. I know we could identify arrogance also with wind, and we'll talk about that, 
But right now, one of the interpretations of negative fire is, is um, arrogance, pomposity, type of, which brings us to the feature of fire that I just said that elevates. But I will get to that shortly. I want to talk more about the features of fire in our personality. So look at fire, two things that come to mind. Fire warms and it illuminates. It illuminates and it warms, which of course is one of the reasons we're talking about it and began the series now, because this is the festival of lights, Hanukkah. But this is really all year round. So Hanukkah, of course, the festival of lights. What we see in light, it warms and it illuminates. Those, of course, are beautiful features. So if you're a person that when you meet others, they feel warmed by you, they feel illuminated by you. Illuminated could be you provide clarity, you're a person who's as a certain certainty, confidence. So illumination and warmth. And warmth, of course, is you warm people's hearts. People feel better. Someone who feels cold and detached, fire has that ability to warm. Just like a warm room. You light a fireplace. Fire has that ability to warm and illuminate. So if that is part of your personality, that is beautiful. Is there a downside to warming and influencing? Only if it intrudes on people's boundaries and violates in some way, it becomes too aggressive. But generally, warming and influencing, we would all agree, is a po- po- positive feature. Okay. but So we have here the positives, the negatives. What else do we see about fire and its features? Let's continue that discussion. Fire rises. It's the only one of the elements that re- completely defies gravity. Even though wind, which we will discuss, has an element of that, but water and earth for sure don't. They're subject to the gravitational pull. Fire were not for the wick. It would expire. It would just go upward. So that's, it rises. It flickers. It doesn't just rise because it's grounded by the wick. It flickers. It has an element of a to and fro motion. What do they express and what do they reflect in human personality? So they reflect the following. The idea of transcendence, that a human being is always striving looking upward, pining to look for something greater than you are. Fire is the perfect example of that. Indeed, in the book of Proverbs, it says that the fire of God is the soul of a human being. The closest approximation of your soul on earth is a fire, a flame, because it defies gravity. Gravity would be referring to things of survival, the things that ground us in this world that are necessary, but they're about your existence, about your survival. Fire represents your transcendent side, which is not incidentally connected to passion, because passion also, passionate for healthy things, is about an excitement to reach greater heights. But let's go back to transcendent. So in that sense, fire is a transcendent force, and like fire rises, our souls rise. Allow that voice to express itself. So write this down as the next step of this course. Write down in your life, do you allow your your spirit to soar? Do you allow yourself to dream, to imagine, and act on it? The fire in you is meant to bring that part of yourself, to elicit and evoke that part of you, to work and reach upward. Look at the difference between a human being and other creatures. We walk upright, and because of that we look up. We look up to heaven. And that just the satisfaction of our curiosity has developed a trillion dollar industry starting with NASA, space exploration. Because we're simply curious beings. We see the skies, we see the heavens, the stars, the planets. What's out there? Is there someone like us out there? What's going on? Even on a very physical level. Imagine on a spiritual level, we're looking, what, who put us here? What is our reason that we're here? a type of aspiration and search and seeking, the soul's search for purpose, for meaning, the soul's seeking transcendence, to break out of the confines of our fixed boundaries and our fixed routines. That's what fire does. It's not, you can't contain fire. It's, that's what it does. It's constantly seeking, which leads me to the word restlessness. Human restlessness. Now, restlessness for some identifies with anxiety. That's perhaps where the fire is out of control to some extent. But in a healthy sense, it's the healthy angst that each person should have, that restless spirit that you're not satisfied with animal bliss. 
You're a flame, a burning flame, seeking, reaching, licking the sky. And then you have your wick, which is like your body that grounds you to make sure that you don't fully just expire in a type of uh, burnout, which unfortunately people have done in that, in that search for transcendence. When you don't have the counterbalance, which we'll talk about shortly, is, can create, again, an extreme fire that consumes them. So this brings me to the next point in fire. The flickering element is what the Kabbalists call rotze and shuv. Literally means to run and return, to and fro, tension and resolution. The tension of that angst, of that seeking, of that restlessness, because you're looking for something greater than yourself. You're not satisfied with animal bliss, which, which I mentioned earlier. Animals do not look upward. They focus on the ground on which they live. They, they, they breed. They protect their young. They feed. Very basic. They have not improved their lives, built better technologies. They're not interested in uh, mobile smartphones or any phones for that matter. They don't go to therapy. They don't have that restlessness that humans have because the fire in them is focused completely to the things their survival. We do have that restlessness. And as I said, it needs a counterbalance, which is why fire flickers. It reaches upward, only to come down again, and back and forth. Literally, like what? Like a cardiogram. The wave. Peaks and valleys. If it goes, if it's extreme, the peaks are too high and the valleys are too low, that's a wildfire, and not a smooth one, that creates anxiety. Or it creates too much uh, complacency. So you want to have the perfect measure of reaching upward and coming down. Tension and resolution. A healthy tension that I want to grow and you're restless and you work toward it. And then resolution that you don't, you're not only driven by that, by that tension, you also have resolve. You internalize. So you're like climbing a ladder, always looking upward, looking to great, reach greater heights, but then inter- internalizing before you move forward. When you climb a ladder, you don't climb 10 rungs at a time. One step, forward, the other foot is still on the lower rung, then that goes to the next higher rung, and, and you do it in a process, in a systematic process, which allows you to balance it and create harmony, because as I said you don't want extreme fire, when you see for example a log burning, a log that's wet or moldy or something like that, that's a fire, that's a, that's a wildfire it's sparkling, it's noisy it's a, when do you see a log that's dry we said dry and hot, and a flame burns, there's a certain calm to it because it's burning, but at the same time, it's also balanced. So you want to make sure that that balance is always in place. So we've covered quite a few different elements of fire. To just sum up, we talked about passion. We talked about, uh, we talked about uh, the, uh, the drive. We discussed the element of fire of warming and illuminating warmth and illumination and now we've discussed tension and resolution transcendence and resolve a constant need and what does that reflect I was going to say earlier that reflects the heartbeat contraction and expansion the cardiogram the wave the breath exhale and inhale these are all examples of the two poles that fire represents so you see from this my friends that fire is a feature that helps us understand ourselves better. Because if you can identify that fire element within you, you now have a good picture of those components. And the more you can describe it in your personality, which is why I suggested writing things down, then you basically are identifying the fire within you. Let's take it now into a practical game plan. A practical game plan. Um, So we should also mention, before the game plan, the negative aspects of fire. I spoke about anger and about arrogance. So, of course, we need to do is make sure that's checked. Now, is it all right to get angry for the right reason? As long as you're in control of it. When you light a fire and you're in control of it, then you allow it to grow to the point that it achieves what it has to achieve. Warming food, heating or boiling water, But if the fire gets out of control and you're not in control of it and it gets into control, then you have trouble. 
So if you're talking about anger, which is very deliberate, where you say, I'm upset about something someone I lo- love has done, or something I have done, but it not, does not turn into a rage, an uncontrollable rage. It's deliberate, it's planned. Then you're talking about that you care. Caring is not anger. Caring means I'm not complacent, I'm not indifferent, I'm not apathetic, I care. That would be an example. I, w- I wouldn't call it anger, to be honest. I would just call it caring, concern. Fire, as anger, is usually an anger that is not in control. And you can justify from today till tomorrow, but it's not a healthy expression. And the same thing with arrogance. That burning arrogance, where you are feel greater than others. You rise, you try to be dominant, and so on. That does not have a positive side to it. If indeed you have something in your life that is important to be achieved, like people are leaders, a leader does not mean you have to be aggressive about it, which leads me to the fire element of aggression. Fire has an aggressive side to it. It's aggressive. That's why it's frightening. It identifies with the color red. Water will identify with white blue, but fire identifies with red. Red, look at why red lights, red lights. Because red, everyone knows, is a form of like danger. Stop. It means be careful. Which leads me to yet another feature of fire, as the Kabbalists put it, with the word gevura. Gevura means, literally, it can mean power, strength, dominance, aggression. Now, there's a positive side to gevura, and that is discipline, discretion. That's why you see when fire, what fire does is it... Um, it crumples things up. It, it con- contracts things. You put a piece of paper in fire or any other object, the fire will contract it because fire is a concentrator. So in the healthy way, concentration is harnessing, is uh, directing, is guiding, is focusing, laser energy. When fire, however, spreads and it's not focused, then it could be problems again. So that leads to the element of also that aggression. Now, aggression we know is not a negative word. But to be firm is not a negative thing. Again, balanced fire, contained fire. So we have now introduced a few more features that are connected to fire, and you can list that as well. So let's now go to a practical game plan. Once you've identified the fire within you, the fiery elements in your character, then the key thing is to really now create a type of um, report card that evaluates How strong is that fire in your life? And is it being directed toward positive things? And don't be bashful. List as many things as you wish. Some we've mentioned, some we haven't. And then give it a 1 to 10. Like saying, okay, I have a certain angry side to me, but I keep it at bay. So let's say we'll give it a 3. 10 would be when it's out of control. 1 would be that you really don't have that side to you, at least not in any expressive way. Okay, so... The same, do that throughout, whether it's the passion, whether it's warming and influencing others, whether it's transcendence, whether it's restlessness. Do you have more transcendence and less resolve? Which means you dream a lot and you're very frustrated you're not getting your dreams fulfilled. All can be gauged in a 1 to 10 type of number. I'm using that as an example. You can do 1 to 100 if you're able to have it that nuanced. But 1 to 10, I think, is a fair way to go. You'll be surprised some ways pleasantly, in some ways maybe not so pleasantly, at the results. You'll really see yourself now like a reflection of yourself through the lens of fire, how fire plays itself out in your personality. You'll see the areas that you're very strong in, but you'll also see whether you're actualizing them or not. You'll see areas where you're weak in. What do you think is the next step after that? Once you see it, I can assure you, your awareness itself will already want to make you work on it. Now, I'm not suggesting everything is easy to change just because you become aware of it. But awareness then gives you something to work in, to bite into. And then make it a goal. It could be on a weekly basis a goal. It could be more often or less often. Make it a goal to say, okay, I'm going to work on the fire within me. The areas that need somewhat more more, uh, taming, more lowering the temperature, harnessing, the areas where I have passions that I'm not exercising, I'm not actualizing. Make it a goal. Don't take on too many goals because it usually doesn't happen. 
do it in a way that you know you can achieve it. And make a goal. By the end of next week, I would like to identify area, an area where fire is being, uh, being over-dominant and needs to be somewhat tamed and say, this is my goal, to tame my anger, to tame my passion for something that may not be that important or even destructive in my life or other people's lives. Replace it with a positive passion. Make that the goal. I really enjoy helping people. So do it. Find things you're passionate about. Make them your projects. This is how you take and harness the fire in your personality and turn it into something positive, growthful. And I assure you that you, once you start doing it in a consistent manner, important consistency, you will see a visible difference in your life. Now we're just covering here element number one. We have three more to go. But element one, number one alone can transform your life to become that living example of a walking, fiery, passionate person, but a fire that warms and influences, that warms and illuminates and influences, a fire that transcends, a fire that is passionate and driven toward good goals. That changes a person's life. And keep in mind, your soul is compared to fire. But many of our souls are remain quite uh, dormant because we've been shaped by other people's expectations and demands of us. So the voice of your soul, and I like to call it the song of your soul, and everybody has their song, is sometimes undercover. Sometimes, more than sometimes. You may not even be aware of what your soul's fire is like. So here's the time to start expressing it, to start building the courage necessary to allow it to speak. And you don't have to begin big. Again, write down on a piece of paper, write down, here are some of my voices, here are some of the things that really resonate with me. Begin singing it, begin singing it to yourself. Sing it to people that you care about, that care about you. Sing it with passion, with a fiery passion. And what you'll start seeing is that there are parts of you that have gone, are uh, MIA. They're there, waiting to be released, like a pilot flame that just needs, needs that type of fanning to get it expressed. But that's what it's about. So allow yourself to do that. Make it a goal to express and develop the fire within you. Now, when the mystics talks about fire, talk about fire, as I mentioned, there's that element of that rotsay and shuv I said, to and fro, tension and resolution. But there's another thing I want to address. Fire is often used in terms, I mean, even drugs are sometimes called foreign fire, alien fire, because they're very powerful and they are consuming. But the problem there is they consume you instead of you consume. Well, I wouldn't say that you consume it, but it consumes you, it takes control over your life. In the, in the Bible, there's a story actually of the two sons of Aaron, who in their great passion, passion, ran into the temple, the holy temple, to experience a divine transcendent experience. They were so passionate about it that they lit, it says, a strange fire, a strange flame, and it consumed them. And they first burn out in history. And based on this story and others, it became a very important principle in all spiritual disciplines that you need to make sure that the fires that are lit and, and they're coming from a good place are not an expression of your, de- overexpression of your desire. Because if it becomes more about you than about what needs to be achieved, then it's not transcendence. The transcendence is another selfish expression. So it's important to remember overall that though fire, a fiery soul, is critical. And as a matter of fact, as I said, many of us have the problem the other way around. The fires in us have, have been either extinguished, is a strong word, but definitely put, kept at bay, or almost nil, where feelings of resignation, of fatalism, of no hope, hopelessness. So we need to light those fires, but then we need to also qualify it by saying that the fires on the other extreme, that don't have an element of discipline and grounding, can be equally problematic. And that is why it's vital, especially for someone who's a more, call it a free spirit, someone who has a fiery soul. Now, we all have a fiery soul, but someone whose soul 
very dominantly fire, and they express it to really also check it. And that's vital because without that, it ends up being a force that, though it comes from a good place, ends up being a negative one, a negative type of fire. So fire is an uh, interesting uh, force in our lives. You can't live with it. You can't live without it. You can't live with it. I mean, you can't live with a fire that's out of control. And it's necessary in our lives. It's such a vital component. So I hope this sheds some light and helps us all come to a, uh, a deeper understanding of ourselves. Because that's the goal. There's an expression that the universe in microcosm is the human being. You are a universe, a small universe. And that universe, just as there's the four archetypal elements of fire, wind, water, and earth, they also exist within you. And by expressing and experiencing and evaluating the fire within you, you become a very different type of person. You become much more in control of yourself and you learn to express and discover newer strengths that you may not have been aware of. As I said, I find many people going both directions, some people who that fire was really beat out of you and people don't have that passion. They were criticized, they were dismissed, invalidated, and you don't want to follow, you don't want to be hurt. People the other extreme who have uncontrolled fire and sometimes it's interconnected. Some people who've been suppressed, when they finally break out, they break out in an uncontrolled fire. And the key to all healthy relationships, the key to all interactions is to have passion in your life, to have fire, but a fire that does not hurt the other, does not violate another, a fire that is balanced. As a matter of fact, the Hebrew words for man and woman is ish, ish and isha. They both have the word fire in it. The man is a fire, but he has the letter yud, which is a divine force, a divine spark. Isha is also ish, but has a letter hey, which is a divine expansiveness. So if you just if you take out the divine element, that humble element, you have two fires, and two fires can destroy each other. But when you include, include the Yud and the He, the name of God, you include the measure of humility, and that the fire is not about you, it's about building something greater than you are, then they join together. It's two fires that lick and join. You ever see how fires come together? They become one, literally. They're not two. You see, as they get closer, they become one. And finally, one more feature of fire, which is so beautiful. Everything in this material world is, is measured by time and space. I have something, and I want to give it to you. Let's say I have a piece of food, I want to share it with you. I will have less. I may do it anyway, because I love you, and I care about you, and that's more important than my piece of bread, my full piece of bread. I want to give you my seat, I have to get up for my seat. Basically, you get diminished as you give to others. However, you give anyway because you get something back in return, like giving love, giving charity, giving of yourself. You, you, become, maybe you may have less, but you become much more due to the present, but the, but due to the experience. But the physical element is, yes, you only now have a half a piece of bread because you shared it with someone else for a beautiful reason. Fire, interestingly, when you light another person's fire, you don't get diminished. You light a candle, and one candle lights the other, the first one doesn't get weaker. It can go ad infinitum. You can light one fire, another fire, another fire. So in addition to all the fires joining as one when they're humble, humble fire, they also have the element of perpetuate, perpetuation. It can warm and influence and warm and illuminate and influence other people, and you don't become less. As a matter of fact, you become more. Not just the quality, but the fire becomes greater, and fires join, everything becomes greater. So we have here another example, fire is yet another example of doing things that perpetuate without weakening the initial entity. So my friends, I hope you use these fiery lessons and messages in the fullest possible way. Passion, drive, transcendence, illumination, warming, in ways that are perpetual, in ways that create more unity and ultimately illuminate your life and the life of your loved ones, of your community, and it extends as fire does, it spreads. A ripple effect, a butterfly effect that impacts the whole world and fills the whole world with warmth and beauty and light. 
May you be successful in harnessing that fire. May you be successful in lighting and igniting other people's passion, other people's souls. The soul that's already there waiting, just waiting to be fanned, waiting to be expressed. Be blessed. Have a very happy Hanukkah and happy holiday, a one of light and illumination and all the best of health. So this has been part one of this four-part, four-element series. So after discussing the temperament of fire, and again, both its strengths and opportunities and challenges, followed by the temperament of water, sometimes referred to those two respectively as choleric and phlegmatic, we now arrived at the Kabbalah of air the sanguine temperament and personality type. Now, it must be stated that this isn't just a black and white distinction that you're one of the four. All of us have all four elements and four, all four facets in our lives. The question is, what is dominant? And what stands out? And what can be developed while being balanced by the other three? So we talk about air now. So let's start with just the physical properties of air. In context of fire and water, so fire is the most sublime in the sense that it defies gravity, it rises. Water, on the other hand, is uh, drawn downward. Fire is hot and dry. On the other extreme is water, moist and, and, and cold. Air is in between the two. It also is light, but it doesn't quite defy gravity like fire. It does float here, fresh air, wind. And in the, in the context of its properties, it is dry and cool. When we study air and we look at it, again on a very basic level, you see it has a certain flexibility about it. Air floats. You open a window, you get fresh air. If obviously necessary for life in so many different ways. In the personality type, when someone has an airy personality, there, there's a lightness of spirit about them. Contrast always helps. Think of a person who's a very heavy personality. We'll be talking about the earth, the earthy personality, very heavy personality, intense. Whereas air is very easygoing. Things wash over. We don't obsess. We don't carry things for a long period of time. And of course, it has its powers and strengths and it has its challenges. Its strengths are obvious. Someone that has that type of personality, it's easy to get along with. Arguments are easily resolved. There's more yielding, more flexibility, just like air. The challenge is that air could also be not that committal. It could be very light, and you feel like there's a certain superficiality to it. So we will be discussing, obviously, how to maximize its strengths and temper and tame its weaknesses and turn them equally into strengths. So you talk about people who are, let's say, spiritual. They call themselves spiritual people. Spiritual people, there is an element of fire that we've discussed, transcendence in the sense of a passionate yearning and longing for something greater. But there's also an element of air, which is a certain, I would even say, not being consumed and defined by structures. That's what air is about. Air can be bottled. Of course, you can bottle air, but then it defies it's very nature. So eerie personality is someone that sometimes has broader perspective and therefore does not get so consumed by a detail. As I said, there's much beauty in that. That spiritual personality has that element of you sense that they're not as grounded, which in this case I'm talking about in a positive way, and they, um, 
they look upwards. Their heads are in the clouds. Dreamers, visionaries, imagination. Sometimes children are very much, very airy, very breezy in that sense. And that's, of course, beautiful. It's so much part of who we are as human beings. Unfortunately, that part of us is sometimes compromised, either because parents, educators, society in general doesn't see it necessarily as productive. We focus much more on the utilitarian aspects of our lives as opposed to the more dreamy aspects. But the truth is dreaming, imagining, hoping, aspiring, that type of expansiveness that ear represents is critical to be a healthy human being. Besides the fact that the opposite could be very narrow and inflexible and stubborn and therefore difficult to have relationships, it's not just not having that negative, it's also, it opens up fresh air. You're not trapped in structures. That's what the true airy personality is about. We have to cultivate that element in us, not allow it to be beaten out of us. I remember reading, I think there's a famous TED Talk, an educator, a, psycholo- psych- a child psychologist, talking about how education focuses so much, focuses so much on efficiency, to create efficient soldiers on the physical sciences and art, music, and so on, are seen as extracurricular hobbies. When in truth, the flexible and impressionable mind of a child is so much more nourished by dreams, by exploration, by adventure, by free-spiritedness, by the airy, sanguine personality type. So it's vital that we, from young age, teach our children, encourage them, reinforce that exploration. There'll be plenty of time to bottle it, to contain it, to to structure it. And the same thing as adults. Find time to do things that you really enjoy in that way, not out of responsibility, but things that are expansive. Listening to music is a very good example. It makes you more airy. It's like fresh air, breeze. It doesn't let you get so trapped in the stale air of your ever your status quo. So when you think of it that way, it's actually a force inside of us that needs to be nourished and cultivated and fed. So write down on a list, where do you stand in this regard? You'll be surprised to find that even if you do have that idealistic side to you, often life takes over and your responsibilities and expectations and demands of others don't allow you to breathe. It's another good word that can be used here, to breathe. So make a list. How many things a day do you do to breathe on your own? And I don't mean the physical breath. That breeze that allows you to go into your own more spiritual space, internal space, calming space. And if you don't find that you have enough time dedicated to that, so then make a resolution right now. I'm going to begin reading a new book, listening to some new music, having a conversation with family members or friends. Introduce fresh air into your life. And you'll be surprised that air in your personality, your temperament, will be released, invigorated, revived. And if you do have a lot of that in your life, great. It doesn't hurt to audit and review it and evaluate it and see where things can be modified. Because we can always grow in this direction. And it makes you into a healthier human being. Let's talk now about the other side of things. What about the downside of air, so to speak? So I mentioned before, air could also be non-committal, not punctual, not reliable. You know those personalities? They're always spontaneous. That's the air part, to have some spontaneity. We must have that in our lives, spontaneity. But on the other hand, the other side of it is a person who's always late, you don't feel that you can really trust and rely on them because they're like air. They're everywhere. Their hat is hanging on many different hooks. 
So we have to be careful to make sure that we ground the floater, that we ground that transcendent spiritual state through various structures, but not structures that compromise or undermine or weaken the air, the free spirit and the lightness of spirit, but simply turn it into something that's structural. Now, it's not easy. People who are floaters, people who are spiritual in that sense, that eerie personality. I know when you say eerie, it sounds like E-E-R-I-E. Obviously, I mean A-I-R-Y. It's difficult for a person like that to feel ground. That's exactly why they're that spontaneous. That's why they're so adventurous, so exciting many times. But that is, like in any situation, there's always a counterbalance. You must have balance because it's very easy for air to just dissipate. You want that air to be a part of some type of life structure, family, community, commitments. On a personal note, I have a lot of air in my personality in that sense, but I found it necessary from young age to make sure to ground it in commitments, good commitments, which sometimes are difficult, to be very perfectly honest. But they actually, in a way, enhance the air. That They enhance that floating element. Because then you have that balance between the two. And you also see productive results. It bears fruit. It's not just a selfish, transcendent spiritual experience. What are some other so-called negative elements in this third personality type, third temperament called air? The lightness could also lead to a certain frivolousness, you know, casualness, and sometimes we need to be more serious. It, it's associated with mockery, you know, making fun, boasting, worthless conversation, pomposity, being pompous, and other such features which are not positives, obviously. You make light of things that are supposed to be taken more seriously. Now, sometimes that's a defensive mechanism. People may do that just to protect themselves, you know, laughing at others, mocking others, turning everything into a joke. is a way of protecting your own interests, in a sense, maybe because you feel insecure. Or it just may be the downside of air that's not being tamed properly. So there is a darker side to it that needs to be tempered, that needs to be addressed. So what do you do about that? Well, like in every situation, awareness is have the cure. Once you're aware that you're doing something, it's much easier to deal with it. Many of the flaws and um, weaknesses of our character thrive by not evaluating or looking at it. So you just, uh, that's what you naturally do. Someone says something, you dismiss it. Easy to make fun of something, easy to boast. But if you make another list in your journal where you write down that you are actually doing it, document it, and look at it, closely, maybe on a daily basis, you may discover that you have a pattern of being that type of making light of things when you shouldn't be doing that. Now, I don't mean this in an intense way where you have to evaluate every step you make. Listen, all of us are going to make a joke here and there, and there's nothing wrong with that. Humor is a very healthy part of our lives. We just don't want it to be just coming from a superficial place where you're just casually dismissing something without really focusing and understanding that certain things need to be taken seriously. I find very intelligent and very spiritual people who have not found that grounding, and that's what they do. Their strengths also become their weakness. Easy to not commit themselves to something, so everything becomes very ambiguous. Ambiguity is yet another so-called negative element of air. So, We look at it, and we do what we can. 
We try to minimize it. We try to channel it. Look, having, let's say, a sharp mind, sharp wit, where you can see the humor in things is good. But where is it not? When it becomes mockery, when it becomes boastful, where it becomes frivolous. Silliness. You know, spending time on, on what in Yiddish they call narishkeit, nonsense. Loose and idle and worthless conversation. These are, they, they sound innocuous, they don't sound like very destructive forces, but they are, ultimately they're insidious. They undermine who you are, undermine your relationships with others. So the air personality has both sides to it, great strengths and great challenges, as do the other personality types. Let's speak a moment about how they interact. So now that we've covered three of them, fire, water, and air, all three, if you think about it, are tremendous assets in your life. Fire, we talked about passion. We talked about reaching upward, a type of yearning, transcendence, Yes, it has some overlap with air, as I mentioned. But fire, of course, is far more fiery. It's downside, the challenges of anger, of rage. Fire out of control. Burning passion that needs to be balanced. Water, we spoke about water being the opposite, opposite extreme of fire. Calming, soothing, submerging, love, giving. The downside, it could also flood. A fire, fire can, water can flood us. Water also leads to pleasures that are not, if they're not disciplined, can also be all-consuming and destructive. And air, if you think about it, is like a certain balancing between fire and water, but it introduces that third dimension that we've been discussing, which is that personality that just takes things in a very calm way, easygoing. That has, there's a parallel with that and overlap with water as well. But of course here, it's far more in the free spirit nature. As air, water also expands, but it doesn't have quite that freedom as air does. Water is contained wherever it may be contained. It's, it's, not a, it's still a liquid, it's not solid, but, it's, but air is more amorphous, more nebulous, in that sense, less materialistic and more free, to, free of structures. So when you think of all three of them, what I would suggest, and that was my suggestion, each of these parts, is to write down on paper, where do you stand in each of them now? Compare notes. The fire within you, the water within you, the air within you. Let's talk about one more aspect from a Kabbalistic perspective about air. Air, sometimes referred to in Hebrew as ruach, ruach, is also one of the names of the soul. The soul has five names. The Hebrew is nefesh, ruach, neshama, chaye, yechid. Nefesh means spirit. Ruach literally means also spirit, but in this case like air. Neshama is a soul. And the other two are the more transcendent elements in the soul. Ruach also is connected to breath. It says God, when he created the human being, he breathed the breath of life. The spirit of life. Breath. Breath is the air within us. That's how we inhale and exhale. And what exactly are we inhaling and exhaling? Air. Oxygen. So necessary for our blood and for our very vitality and life force. So we see that air is not just the air out there, it's also the air that we inhale and then exhale the waste. And it's a constant process, breathing, inhaling, and exhaling. You see so many exercises are connected to that. But on a deeper level, it really reflects, similar to what we spoke about in fire, the two poles of the heartbeat, contraction and expansion, inhaling and exhaling, 
is a process, if you think about it, that maintains the true vitality of what defines a human being. We're never static. It's constant movement, which is what air is about. Air is, not, air is restless, but not quite like fire, but also in the sense where it does not remain locked in one place. I mentioned, of course, you can take air and put it into a container, but air in its natural way is exactly that. When you feel the breeze, a summer breeze, or a winter breeze for that matter, there's something about introducing fresh air. And we know that everything in life, if it's static, if there's no fresh air, it becomes a breeding ground for all types of negative forces. Yes? Think of an infection. Infection will fester when it's closed. You open it up to the air, air has a certain healing element because it brings fresh nutrients, fresh energy. And the same thing is psychologically. Many of us are trapped in a place in our lives. We have the same friends, the same customs, the same rituals and routines. You can imagine, especially in the time of a pandemic, that can become quite challenging. But in all times, at all times, a human being thrives on fresh air. However, it becomes comfortable. You know, if I just sit in my house, I don't have to do anything. I don't have to make a move. There's no risks involved. There's no having to discover something new and all the challenges that come with that. I have already my trusted security blankets and, and comfort zones. Many of us feel, you know, I could become, I could just remain here. What that leads to is lethargy. Definitely not growth. Bring fresh air into your life. I mentioned before, read a new book. Make a new friend. Introduce new ideas into your life. This is bringing air, just like breathing in fresh air. This air will also reinvigorate and revitalize who you are. So in the cosmic picture, the way the Kabbalists put it, they say air is the way that the cosmos are constantly renewing themselves. That reflects on a very physical level the air of this earth, the winds that blow. So, of course, wind can also turn into a hurricane, a tornado, a cyclone, other forces. But that, of course, is when it's too strong. But on a healthy level, if we had no winds on earth, we would not have that vacuum cleaner effect of blowing out the dust, blowing out the toxins, blowing them away, and introducing fresh, fresh air. The same thing is emotionally and psychologically. We need to have that type of flow. That ear flow, inhale, exhale. And I'm speaking now not on the physical level, I'm speaking on the personal level. I find in my life that meeting new people, seeing new challenges, sometimes daunting ones, but they actually bring out the best in you because you need to dig deeper and you need to introduce some fresh perspective. You can't just rely on yesterday's formula. Do that and it will change your life. So there on the list again, let's go back to the list. Mark down some resolutions. How am I going to introduce fresh air into my life? So, my friends, this sums up the third temperament, the sanguine air personality type, the positive sides of the lightness of spirit, of transcendence, of a free-spiritedness, the flexibility and the yielding, the fresh air, new adventure, spontaneity. At the same time, making sure to counter not to turn this into frivolousness, into silliness, into lightness that's just a waste of time. We all need, obviously, downtime, but not to turn it into something that is superficial and also very, very often dismissive. Rest assured, if you focus on these things, it will enhance your life, make you a better person. Just the aware, awareness itself is very powerful. But especially when you introduce these elements into your daily activities. So no matter what personality you type you are, no matter what your temperament is like, air, everyone needs fresh air. Everyone needs to breathe. Everyone needs new hopes, new 
possibilities and recognize yourself that you're not this, we'll call it, um, stubborn, inflexible structure. You breathe. Just learn to breathe. Thank you so much. This has been the third part of this four-part series. Meaningfullife.com is our website where you can find this program and so many others. Please take advantage of our full calendar of, of events covering many different topics that address our well-being, spiritual self-care, your spiritual and psychological health. This has been Simon Jacobson, and it's been an honor speaking with you. Stay in touch. Communicate with us. Let's breathe together. Let's cross-pollinate and reconnect with each other because cross-pollination is also achieved so often through the air, the wind that carries the pollen from one plant to another. All of us have different temperaments and personality types. But in truth, it's not that black and white because we have a combination of them and they interact with each other. They're interconnected. So yes, though the dominant gene, so to speak, the dominant feature in your personality may be fiery passion, fire, you also have a water archetype, so to speak, within you. A more calming, a more soothing, more peaceful aspect. For some, that may be the dominant feature. And then there are the other two. Wind or air and earth. We will be addressing now number two, the water archetype. That feature, that personality. In some circles, in some schools of thought, these four are compared with the personality types of fire connected to choleric, water to phlegmatic, wind or air, to sanguine, 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 <laughs> and earth to melancholic. But we're speaking about it in a broader sense than just those four. So let's discuss the water aspect of our lives with obviously the goal, identifying that feature in our personalities, accentuating and looking for ways to express it in a healthy way, and taming and harnessing the negative elements that come from this personality type. As we did in part one about fire. Now, interesting, fire and water, we always see them as the two poles, and they are indeed that way. Fire is described as passionate, fiery. In its features, it's dry and hot. Water is the exact opposite. Water is cool and moist. And its effect on us, and the way we treat it, the way we look at it, is also a different effect. Though, as we'll discuss, water can be destructive, and as in the flood, as in uh, water damage, as in a tsunami, but generally speaking, water soothes us. Fire is connected more to fear. Though, yes, fire-controlled fire is warmth, comfort, we can't exist without it. But overall, fire is a much more aggressive force, where water is a much more calming force. We never enter or submerge ourselves into fire. We do so into water. Water has that nurturing element to it. So what exactly is this water feature within us? And of course, this just doesn't mean physical water. As the mystics explain, the physical is just a manifestation of the spiritual. So when we speak about water, we're really talking about the archetype, the personality type, the temperament. And that evolves into the features that we know in the physical world as water. So let's talk about these elements. We talked about soothing, calming, relaxing, submerging ourselves. There's something about being nurtured and embraced by water when we enter into water, whether it's at a beach or a swimming pool. And it's not a surprise because we all began our lives submerged for nine months in the embryonic fluids 
in our mother's womb. I don't know how much research was done on this, but the Kabbalists and the mystics explain that that water being submerged there is the key to developing an element of security in our lives. You feel nurtured, you feel enclosed, you feel wrapped around, as I said, hugged, embraced. It's exactly the feeling when you go into a bath, into a spa, into the water. There's something about it that feels comfortable, literally like someone hugging you. But here is total immersion, total submerging yourself. Into what? Into a reality that is greater than yourself. When someone hugs you, when someone loves you, that's what you feel. You feel cared for. And that's why it's soothing. And that's why it's calming. So water's personality is far more the loving hug as opposed to fiery passion. Ever all of us need love, and love indeed is compared to water. It's liquid, it's moist, it's not dry, it's not arid. It brings out the moisture within us, it makes us feel cleansed, it makes us feel um, nurtured, and it makes us feel moist. When something is dry, it's very tight, it's minimal. When you feel a type of like refreshed, that's the word I was looking for, refreshed, it brings out the best in us. And yet there's also another side to water, like everything, always has the other side to it, which when untamed or uncontrolled can also cause other issues, which we shall discuss. But let's first focus more on this positive side to it. So in both receiving love and giving love, essentially you're accessing and you're, uh, you're uh, activating and generating the water archetype within you. As I said, all of us need to receive and to give love. So ask yourself, where do you stand with that? You may have passion, you may have fire in you, determination, ambition, but where do you stand in the element of that calmness, of that nurturing, which is so much part of love? Even though love needs passion, but the element of love that we're discussing here is the nurturing element. Are you able to do that? Do you have the presence of mind, the patience? Do you give it the time necessary? So that's the first question. And you'll find very often that you're fully capable of having that watery element both in receiving and in giving, with the focus being on the giving, but we just don't uh, focus on it. We don't um, spend time, we don't invest. So obviously it remains somewhat more dormant. So that is exactly what we do in the second personality type, is we focus on this aspect of ourselves and do whatever it takes to act- activate it. From the beginning, from the moment you awake, expressing that type of kindness, bringing calm to people around you. Very often we're around people and we feel jittery. We feel nervous because they're nervous. You want to be a person that when someone's near you, they feel calm, they feel relaxed. Even if there's a challenge, they feel we'll get through it. This is all the nurturing quality, the refreshing quality of water. What about the other side? So where does water become something that needs to be controlled or needs to be channeled and tamed and harnessed? Well, the physical world, we know. Just as it is with fire, we can't live without warmth. But fire out of control is destructive. Water, the same thing. When water is not controlled, it floods. It destroys. What is that in the personality and the psychological temperament? It's when water is just either too relaxed too calm, where you don't feel any angst, any fire. That's on a very basic level. But to take it to the next step, water also makes things grow. So just as love, nourishing, makes things grow, so does water. What what can be the negative side of that? Well, water also, therefore, relates to the elements that give us pleasure. Because that's very much part of what the water does. It makes things grow. 
everything of pleasure, especially in the area of food, needs water to make it grow. But in a broader sense, that particular personality type also is very loving. But what about when that loving becomes selfish? When that loving becomes narcissistic? When there's no controls? It's all about being water everywhere, so to speak. Which is essentially giving in to all the things that give you pleasure and delight without any discipline. So in the mystical terms, fire is connected to gvura, discipline. It's severe, it's strong. Water is connected to love, pleasure, giving. But like all giving, look at the rain. Rain is giving, it nurtures, it uh, moisturizes. The earth makes things grow, but the rain has to come down in drops. If it came down in uh, in, in flood, uh, it came down in in buckets. It would destroy the fields. So it needs a measure to regulate the flow. The same thing with water in our lives. Water in the ocean is great. Rain, but when it starts flooding, when it starts turns into a tsunami, it can create a lot of damage. So too on the spiritual psychological side of things, the love of water needs to have its regulation. Without that, it can become self-destructive and destructive to others. If you give in to all your pleasures, if you give in to all your delights, to everything that calms you, then what happens is, yes, it's beautiful to be calm, but too much of it becomes self-indulgent. And that's where we need to be careful. So watery personalities are people who love pleasure. That's beautiful, as long as it's regulated. So in that sense, we have to look at both sides of that personality type. The first side is to cultivate the positives of it, the positives of water, and the second is to regulate and harness the negative elements. So pleasure is great. Calm is great, a certain element of serenity, the soothing, the moisturizing effect of waters, but not overindulging in it. And it's easy, we all know, it's easy to fall into that trap because that's the nature. When you're submerged, when you feel like you belong, when you feel that type of um, being hugged and embraced, why should you want to ever let go? So we're not letting go in order to eliminate that nurturing love in our lives, we're letting go to be able to regulate it and it should come with a measure of humility. Now let's take this to the next level. The Kabbalists explain that water and land, and we will be talking about earth in the fourth part of this series, we're talking about water now, represent two types of consciousness. One is conscious consciousness and one is super consciousness. Physically, you see on land, all the creatures on land are exposed. In water, all the creatures are submerged in that reality called water. Even though, yes, on earth we have oxygen and we have the atmosphere, but it's not obvious. Whereas in water, it's very clear that everything is submerged. You look at the face, the surface of the ocean, and you see nothing. You can see some waves. Once in a while, you may see a fish or a fin. But overall, what dominates is the water. So the mystics explain it this way, that in our beings, we have two forms of expression. One is our conscious expression. That's like land-like expression. Think of it like speech, when I'm speaking to you right now. It's clear the words are being articulated. You can hear them. How about thought? When you're thinking, your ideas and your, even your very words are all submerged in the waters of the idea. So water reflects much more an inner or deeper state of consciousness. The hidden waters. On a deeper level, that means that there what dominates is a higher state of consciousness. And the focus on the details is not quite there. You ever find yourself listening to music 
and you become so enwrapped in the music, you don't even realize that you have a headset on, that you may be dancing to it. The music completely encompasses you, can transport you to another time and place. That's an example where water is dominating. Something beyond you is lifting you up, wrapping you, and you become, you are essentially absorbed by it. Transcendence in that sense. Same thing, you read a book. You get so immersed, you don't even know you're turning pages. You're reading words. You get so absorbed where the object and the subject melt into one another. So on earth you can say object and subject are two distinct entities. Water, the object and subject become melted as one. It's when you're in the zone. So in that sense, water is the purest state of being. When a child, a fetus, is immersed and submerged in the embryonic fluids, it's exactly what you have. The hug, the nurturing of something greater than the child that gives the child a sense of security. We all need this in our lives. When you are loved by another, completely embraced, unconditional love, you're essentially experiencing that water type of being fully encompassed by something beyond yourself. And indeed, that is the superconscious state. That's why we're not conscious of it. Consciousness already would mean there's an object and a subject conscious of one another. When you become so absorbed, you don't even sense yourself. You don't feel your own sensations because you are being consumed by something greater. So in that sense, the real deeper meaning of love then and nurturing and the calm and soothing element that water provides us or provides for us is rooted in that spiritual state. Now we live in a very conscious-oriented and I would even say materialistic world where things are defined by their identities, not by their being absorbed by identity greater than themselves. But love, which is so necessary in our lives, is exactly that, healthy love. Healthy love means you're completely accepted and embraced by someone or something beyond yourself. And you completely embrace someone Other, another, to the point where there's no difference between the two. When you see in the highest states of intimacy, there's a certain melding, absorption, a union called in the Bible becoming one flesh, where you cannot distinguish between the two because they become literally intimately interwoven seamlessly as one. And in truth, That's an aspiration for every human being to really reach that level where you experience everything in that type of oneness. Now, obviously, intimacy is a unique experience. It's not something you can do 24-7 physically, but psychologically, spiritually, people who are really in the moment are that way all the time. They're never superficial. They're always immersed in something that's beyond themselves while doing the work that needs to be done, like a fish in the sea. So when we talk about the personality then of the archetype and the personality type, the temperament of water in that sense, it's essentially, and I'll introduce you to a new word that you may or may not have heard, a Hebrew word that is so fundamental in mystical thought, and frankly in all thought and psychology. It's called bittel. B-I-T-T-U-L. What does that mean? It means it's a combination of modesty, humility, but above all, suspending yourself in the face of something greater than yourself. You ever stand in front of one of the wonders of of nature and you're so in awe. Again, you you don't feel yourself. You feel absorbed by the experience. That sense of belonging is being submerged in something greater than yourself. So in that, that sense, water offers us a reality that is beyond us. Now, what's the downside of that? The downside of that is if you're completely submerged and you lock everyone else out and you never return to earth, so to speak, to land. The goal is is to bring that superconscious state where object and subject are one back into the world of a subject and an object and basically fuse the two to experience the extraordinary in the ordinary. That's challenging, but that's exactly what needs to be done. So total indulgence 
as I spoke earlier about, into pleasures, into that form of feeling completely connected, has to be checked that realizing it shouldn't become something that's arrogant or selfish at the expense of another. It should be seen as a gift. And we humbly accept that gift into our lives. So, as I said at the outset, all of us have the fire part in our personalities and have the water type. The question is, what's dominant? And the second question is, how are you harnessing it toward the positive ends, accentuating it, amplifying the positive, and how are you controlling and taming and tempering the negative aspects of it? Because everything has that positive and negative. So I would suggest two things. First, let's focus on the water part of ourselves to go back to what I said earlier, which is sit down and focus on yourself and say, do I have calm moments in my day? Am I soothing to others? The nurturing part. How loving am I? And it's not whether a question whether you are personally loving, it's whether you're acting on it. What can I do to actualize more of that watery, moisturizing element? Am I making others feel that they belong? Essentially affirming another. And then, how much am I indulging in it? Am I indulging in it too much? Am I able to temper it? Can I harness it somewhat? These are the questions that we ask. The next part is now, but let's bring it together with a fire that we discussed in the previous part of this four-part series. So once you've done the exercises around the fire type, personality type and temperament, now you could say to yourself, okay, how do these two play itself out in my life? Which is the more dominant one? Should I look for more balance? And we're not talking about fighting your inclinations or fighting your personality type. We're talking about guiding it, directing it, channeling it. And it's good to know which one is more dominant, which one is more powerful, which one plays itself out in your life more. And you may discover a surprising result. And that is that though one of them is dominant, maybe the other one just simply needs more exercise, more cultivating. And that's the next step in our work, is looking how these two play, again, play out with each other. So take an example. Passion is an excellent and necessary component in life. But as we discussed, passion could also lead to forces that are very violent and arrogant and aggressive. Water is essentially the counterbalance because it's soothing, loving, kind. And vice versa, fire can help direct water toward being more balanced and not just love, but some discipline, some um, channeling, regulating, guiding it. In love, we need to have passion, but we also need to be nurturing. These two need to be balanced with each other. Very often passion, when we're very passionate, we can forget about the other because it consumes us. So you see from that how each of them need the other to counterbalance and create the right mix, the right blend, the right harmony. <clears throat> As we will go through the other two, what we, the goal obviously is to look at all these different elements and different temperaments independently and then how they all interact with each other. And you will discover tremendous insights into who you are. So to go back to the water element, let's talk a bit more about certain particular features. When you drink a cup of water, it's refreshing. And indeed, water is very much part of who we are. Is it 75, 80% of the human being is made up of water? Two-thirds of this earth is covered by water. So we see how much, how critical it is to life itself. And that is because love, which is the symbol of water, 
is critical to life. Take away love, it's like taking away water. That's what nurtures. But there's another element. I remember when I was a younger man, my parents took out a country home, rented a country home in Brooklyn near the Atlantic Ocean. And I would go there for dinner, sometimes stay over the night. I remember going out to the sea one night. Teenager, learning, exploring. And I remember the relentless waves. It wasn't a stormy night. It was a calm night, actually. But the waves never stopped. And in my idealistic, poetic mode, ruminating, dreaming, I said, maybe they'll stop for a moment. Well, I waited all night till the morning, and they never stopped. Actually, it gave me that sense, a physical sense of what if infinity is like. Something that's relentless, doesn't stop. And we all know how hypnotized we are. How uh, captivated we are by the f- sinking of the Titanic. The Titanic, as its name suggests, large, enormous, unsinkable, and then humbled like the smallest creature by the great mighty ocean. So there's something about water that is on one hand, as I said, soothing and calming, but there's another thing it's about, it's enormity and its sheer power, which you don't really see. You see it during, God forbid, tragedies, or tsunamis, or storms. But generally speaking, water is very calming. And even the waves, the relentless waves, generally speaking, unless there are strong winds and a storm out there, they have a certain calming effect. The sound of the waves, the sound of water, many people use that to allow themselves, lull them into sleep. It is because it reminds us of the nine months of those embryonic fluids in which we were immersed. It gave us a sense of belonging. But at the same time, it also has a power of infinity, which isn't a contradiction, because what is infinite if not love? The love you give to someone, the love you express, lasts forever. What you take lasts only as long as you own it, as long as you use it, and then it dissipates. Piece of food, money, whatever it may be. The love you give lasts forever because it impacts another person in ways that we can't even measure. It's calming and soothing. And the love that we received shaped us into who we are. Unfortunately, we live in a world where many of us did not have that watery beginning. We didn't feel that full nurture. We had the nine months but we not necessarily felt submerged, felt embraced and loved. So we need to work on building that part of ourselves. And that, again, is part of this exercise of developing the water personality, temperament within you. So if you are that type of personality, that calm, serene, soothing, relaxed type, see that as a great gift because that brings calm to others, besides to yourself. But no, we also need the fire part, the passions, and also know that you don't want to be over calm in the sense where you're just indulging in whatever it is that satisfies you. You want to use it for a higher purpose, because that indeed is the essence of water, being submerged in something greater than yourself. The hidden world, the hidden worlds, the worlds that are beyond our conscious grasp. So in the end of the day, we're looking to bridge the superconscious water into our conscious lives. If each one of us did that, individually and collectively, what kind of world would we live in? So Isaiah says it clearly. We will live in a world, he says, there'd be no more evil and no more destruction. You know why? Because the world is filled The earth is covered. The exact words are filled with the the divine knowledge as the waters cover the sea. So there's a seabed, 
but they're covered, they're submerged by water. That's the analogy that Isaiah the prophet uses for transformation of this globe, of this earth. The thing we all aspire to, a better world, a utopia. A world where matter and spirit are fused as one. A world where the conscious is integrated with the superconscious. A world where water does not destroy, but water submerges, encompasses, hugs and embraces everything on earth. That's on the collective and on the personal that each of us is submerged in these deeper and higher waters. So just one simple personality type, one simple temperament, like water, look how much it contains. The messages, the lessons. And that's the focus of this part too. List as many examples as possible of how you are a water temperament in your life, how it plays itself out. What can you do to make it grow, to develop it, to exercise it? Where does it need some checking, checks and balances, some tempering, some channeling? And you'll be on your way to yet another exhilarating experience of yourself in a new and fresh way. This has been part two of a four elements course, a four-part course, the power, the power of Water, the Kabbalah of Water, Hidden World. Next week we will speak about the Kabbalah of Wind, or sometimes called Air. So now we've arrived, after discussing fire, water, air, to earth. And just as fire and water are like two poles, that counter each other, the same is with air and earth. Earth is the heaviest of the four elements. So psychologically speaking, spiritually speaking, earth is the the heaviest aspect of a personality. On one hand, its positive nature is its being grounded. Are you down to earth? The airy, breezy personality is someone more of a floater, more transcendent, a dreamer, often at the expense of not implementing, executing. What do they say? It's 1% the idea, the dream, the vision, and 99% execution. Earth, on the other hand, is the grounder. But it comes with its challenges as well. Sometimes you're too grounded. You're too practical, too much concretization where you do need an element of the ethereal, of the air, of the breeze, of dreams, imagination, what is possible. So they are two forces that are meant to complement and interact with each other. Now, as I've explained, we all have all four temperaments, the fiery passion, the calmness and nurturing water, the floaty breeziness and lightness of spirit of air and the groundedness of earth. The question is, what's dominant? And above all, not just what you are, but what you're possible of being. <clears throat> because the goal is to, to cultivate and nurture these different personality characteristics within us to maximize them. Just like you're born with muscles and you're born with a brain, using them and exercising them is actually the key of actualizing their potential. The same thing is with your personality type. And on the other end, to look at some of the negative elements that could be an outgrowth of each of these archetypes and learn to harness it, to temper it, to channel it. And then we come away not just with four different characteristics, but we come away also with something that's a symbiosis, an integrated human being that is a combination of fire, water, air, and earth. So let's get into the earthy 
elements. We'll start with the positive, the groundedness. You see this in companies, you see this in relationships. A healthy relationship is always going to have a combination of some dreams, things that perhaps are beyond us, imagining spontaneity of air, but you also need the groundedness. Sometimes it's two spouses. One may be more the air type, one may be the earth type. When they work together, it's brilliant. They can clash because they have differences. But when they work together, that would be the optimal. The same thing is in a company, even though I don't want to compare it to a personal relationship, but it's the same idea. You need the dreamer. You need the floater. But you also need the concretization. You need to bring it down to earth, to ground it. The best example of a, of a, a physical example where you see this in, in working so effectively and efficiently is a tree. Yes, the common tree. I don't know if a tree is common, but I mean to say, just look at a tree and study a tree. It's the only physical item that grows in two directions at once. The roots continue to dig deeper into the ground, serving as the foundation of the tree, as well as the source of its sustenance, moisture that the roots draw from the ground, and they will follow and look for that moisture. And then the tree grows upward, branches off, depending what type of tree. Each one has its own personality. If it's a fruit tree, it will grow besides branches and leaves, also fruits. So on one hand, a tree has deep groundedness, a very strong concrete foundation. On the other hand, it expands. So which one of the two personalities is it? What would you call a tree, air or earth? The truth is it's a combination of both. It's grounded in the earth, very deeply grounded and embedded and planted, but it also expands into the, to the sky. And they're interdependent. If the tree's roots would begin to rot or compromise in some way, it would not be able to grow upward as well. So you need the groundedness to create a strong, unwavering foundation upon which you now can build and expand and grow. In human terms, and the truth is all species really, our early years of our lives, our formative, impressionable years as children, are like building the roots. You're at home, hopefully you have loving parents, a nurturing support system, things you can rely on the security of knowing what bed you're sleeping in, who is there for you, not having to guess whether you are cared for. And of course, the contrast is when one is lacking those type of roots, it affects a person for their entire lives. You have to have that nest. Roots include also extended family, grandparents. You know, you have ancestors, an extended family, cousins, so in the healthiest sense of it, those are the grounding roots that are the basis of a healthy, harmonious life. Often today we see that that is lacking, the earthy element that when, a family, when someone grows up, a child grows up in a broken home where the, fam, where the parents are not getting along or are split, absentee, I'm not even discussing more overt form, forms of abuse, it compromises the earth, the ground, beneath the child. And it's shaky. It affects the way we trust or don't trust, security and insecurity, the fears we develop, the neurosis, the feelings of inadequacy. When it's strongly in place, it's like a nest that the fledglings, the, 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 the newborns, feel they are protected, they are nurtured, they are fed, but not just physically fed, also fed with love. When a child is in its mother's womb, it's the ultimate element of being nurtured in that sense. Okay, now let's go the other direction, growing upward. So as a child has that grounding, and that's in place, and obviously I'm discussing the best case scenario, that's in place, so now what you have is the ability for the child to explore. If a child has to constantly be looking whether I'm getting love 
And what, what do I have to do to please someone? And I'm being criticized or undermined, invalidated. It undermines also the child's ability to just be that free abandon. So for the tree to exp- grow and expand in different directions, branch out, is the development of a child, of a healthy child. Knowing it has its secure home, its secure hearth and roots. And now I can explore. I know I can always come back home, so to speak. Or the home is always there beneath me to hold me up. So there you see the other side developing. As a matter of fact, the air personality, the spontaneity, the dreaming, the imagination, the floating, the transcendence, as well as the water and the fire, cannot truly be fully actualized and fully developed if you don't have the ground beneath you. But when it's there, then you can expand. You can explore possibilities. And you grow up with that confidence that no matter what comes your way, you know that I can explore. I have the confidence to try to take risks. I know I can find, because I have trust in my life, I have love in my life. When the demons are in control and you don't have that grounding security, it hampers our ability to move forward. It hampers the tree's ability to grow and expand. And even if it does grow physically, it is weak in its resolve. That's how important is that grounding element of having solid foundations that are unwavering. So I know it's a paradox. Unwavering, inflexible, firm foundation allows you to be the most flexible, expansive personality out there, interdependent. And it's not a contradiction because one allows and gives you the confidence, gives you the the solidity, if that's the right word, and security to do whatever you think, whatever you feel is possible. It's a beautiful vision of life. All of us deserve it. And these are the two elements that are so important. Well, in this case, we're talking about the one element of earth, but the element that that allows the air to breathe, to grow, to expand to flourish, to thrive. So that is one aspect of earth. In the Kabbalistic language and terminology, earth is therefore that what the Kabbalah calls the malchut, the level of malchut, which in the ten spheratic structure, in the structure of the ten spheres, is the bottom, the, the lowest part, which is compared to earth. Where do things grow? They don't grow in the sky, in the air. They don't grow in water alone. Water allows things to grow. And you have things growing in water. But where do they grow? Not in fire. They grow in the earth. So the heaviest element, which is so much affected by the gravitational pull, because opposed to fire which rises and air which floats, and water, yes, is heavier than the other two, but still light and liquid and uh, fluid in relation to earth, Earth is so grounded in that sense, and yet at the same time, that's where things grow. Because it it creates the fertile ground, using that word intentionally, the fertile ground for things to grow. You need the other three elements for things to grow as well. You need the breathing, you need the air. Take away air, take away water, take away fire and warmth. It will also not allow growth to take hold. But it all happens within the earth. So that's the positive side of being down to earth. Now what about the other side of things? What happens if you only have earth? You only have the grounded element and very practical and everything is very calculated and solid and you can trust it, it's unwavering. But you don't have the expansiveness. Tell me, what would life be like? Besides the the boredom and the monotony, which which is is not conducive to the human being, the spirit would be compromised because our spirits are not earthy. Our spirits are actually transcendent. It's not enough to just live a life of survival, basically based on serving your needs. This is an interesting expression. I believe I used it in the first part with fire. 
where they say that an animal does not see the heavens. Animals walk on all four and basically see the earth all the time. Because that is their role. That's their physiological makeup is consistent with their psychological and spiritual makeup. Their role is to serve a solid part of nature, consistent breeding, protecting their young, feeding, hunting when necessary, those that hunt. But in whatever form or fashion, that's their life. And that's why you don't see an animal looking, seeking to fly to the moon or what's going on on Mars or building better homes and habitats and technologies. Very different than the human being who we walk upright. We see the skies. Not just physically, because also our spirits are, look up, transcendent. So the earth is vital because one part of us, of course, we need to live. And to survive, you need to be on the ground. You can't live in the, in the skies. You need to feed, eat, drink, sleep, other physical needs. But what would we be like if we only had earth? We'd lack that transcendence whether it's in the form of romance and poetry and music, the form of dreaming, the form of spirituality or faith, anything that feeds that element that excites us. The earth is not necessarily an exciting place. It's a solid place. And necessary in the development of every human being. But you can't call it, that's, where, that's not where adventure takes place. Yes, things grow there. And everything grows out of the earth, including the tree, including the human being. But it's the growth that's so important as well. So only earthiness, someone too earthy, can spill over into what we call being materialistic. Hedonistic, and when it goes even further, which can be very much very selfish, very much about me, 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 very much about indulgence in whatever it is that you are indulging in. Lacking that breathing room, that air brings into the picture. The possibilities we spoke about. The imagination. To have your head in the clouds. Yes, with your feet firmly planted on the ground, but with your head in the clouds. So at times, even though down to earth is a good thing, at times it's not always necessary to be the only way that you define yourself. It's important also to have that flexibility. And that's the challenge in life, is to balancing the two. In characteristics, the earth, as stated in the Kabbalistic texts, I'll specifically state, even though I don't believe I said it in the previous parts of this uh, course, that there's a book called Sharik Dusha, The Gates of Holiness, from Rab Chaim Vital, the great student of the Holy Ari, the 15th the 16th century revolutionary mystic. And it's cited at the end of chapter one in Tanya, the great Tanya, where he says and explains the different characteristic types, the different temperaments, sometimes in the negative form. So what does earth associate with? We spoke about fire can be anger, different pa unhealthy passions, spoke about water being indulgence in the pleasures of life. We spoke about air being idle talk, emptiness, vacuous behavior. And earth is associated with two things, melancholy and laziness. Slothfulness is sometimes the word that's used. Why? Because like earth, it's... It's not fluid, not expansive. What's the, the worst case scenario? That translates into a certain melancho melancholic attitude. Depressed, resigned, pessimistic. But you feel heavy. You ever feel heavy? And there are times you feel light. I can do anything. A certain lightness. We all have moments of each mood. But here, let's focus on this. Why? Because the groundedness, lacking the expansiveness, 
can become this heavy part of our personalities and lives, and it can turn into melancholy, which can become even worse, depression, anxiety. Or another form of it, as I said, slothfulness, which is probably interdependent. People are more depressed, are not motivated. So it's the unmotivated side of ourselves. As I said, we all go through moments of this. Some of us have more of it, some less. So what do we do with that? Well, at the same time, as I explained, earth also has its positives. So that's exactly what we do. We look at that. We don't try to eliminate the earth temperament within us. We harness it. So you can ask, how could you harness depression? How could you harness uh, uh, laziness? I'll tell you how. When you don't allow the depression to draw you down, to turn you to uh, demoralize you, the demoralization is the problem. So what does one do when they're in that type of place? Remember, people who are in that heavy spirit usually don't want to be with others. They're not motivated to do things. But when you turn it around, you can harness it and turn it into, you know what, an opportunity of introspection. Because when you're out there in that breezy mode, expansive, floating about, flying around, dreaming, that's not always conducive to accountability to soul-searching, to introspection. Think of it like in business. When there's a downturn in business, good business people don't just see it as a negative. They see it as a time for evaluation. Let's audit ourselves. Let's audit our business. There are times where the market is very open and things are growing, so there the focus is on growth and on development. But when things are somewhat slower, somewhat sluggish, which is yet another feature of earthiness, that's a time for introspection, stepping back and saying, let me look at my life. Where do you see laziness as being a positive? Not laziness per se, because what positive element is there to being lazy? But again, it's the sluggishness that allows you now, okay, you're not ready to go out and go to a party or some other way celebrate. So look inward. Look inward. And this too is connected to the groundedness. Being down to earth, one of, the, one of the aspects of that is that you, that you look closely at things. You know, an accountant I know told me, a high-paid accountant, he says, they pay me top dollar not to listen to me. Because he says the boss of a company, boss of a business, doesn't want to always hear what mistakes they made that cost them millions of dollars. Especially those that have a lot of idealism. Idealism... In a way, when someone starts telling you, one second, the numbers don't add up, an idealist or an artist says, Stop, don't bother me with numbers. The numbers are the grounding element that allows things to thrive, to succeed. So the positive side of it is where you have that groundness. So when there's a, when there's a state of a somewhat sluggishness, you're in that mode. So maybe sit down with, a, I don't say a calculator, physical calculator, but, but assess, evaluate where you are in your life. Because the dreamer part is not going to really do that. Now, I'm not suggesting it's easy, because once a melancholic state of mind consumes us, especially on our, our emotions, it's not that easy to just say, okay, let me just turn it around. But there is a formula here. So here's what we have with Earth. It has its great strengths. We all need that grounded, rooted state of mind, being, it gives us the confidence, the security, the trust, but we also need that expansiveness. The negative sides of earth need to be addressed. And as we always know, awarenesses have the cure. Just being aware of your own sluggishness, of your own earthiness, and some of its negative impact on us, that alone helps tremendously. Obviously, having good friends, having a mentor, having people you can speak to, helps you also counter those forces because the demoralization that comes from anxiety, from melancholy, from the earthy heaviness that can affect, impact us is usually thrives when you're alone and isolated. You isolate yourself. So connecting with others is an excellent way of helping harness, helping channel the earthy part of yourself 
into positive elements. So there you have, my friends, four personality types, four archetypes, four temperaments, four humors. Each one has its own strengths, has its own challenges. We need to learn how to maximize their strengths, appreciate them. So mark, take a paper, piece of paper and mark down, this will be the fourth, let's call it the fourth page in your journal. Earth, the Kabbalah of Earth. One column. How are you doing in the areas, the positive elements of being down to earth? Grounded, accountability, providing security to those around you. How are you doing in that area? Where you provided security and market. You can say in the area, let's say, of trust, one out of ten, I'm at a six, with ten being the best. In the area of security, because I didn't get that much security, I don't give to others, a number three, let's say. I'm just using, throwing out examples. Get yourself a report card of the earthy part of yourself. You'll be surprised what you discover. So list all the positive things we've discussed about earth. As I said, the, the, the groundedness, the accountability, the, the trust, the security, the unwavering elements of it, the consistency. Then list the second column is the negative elements of earth. Being too materialistic, too hedonistic, too grounded. How much of melancholy of earth spills into your life. Depression, anxiety, sluggishness, and laziness. And just mark that as well. And not just how strong it is, but also how often and how often it enters and seeps into your life. Because frequency is also important. And then in column three or on the bottom, you can write, what am I going to do? Based on, these, on, this, on this report card, this accountability, here are the things where I'm weakest in, I need to build that. Whether it's the positive, in, harness, in, in, in maximizing and actualizing the positive elements, seeing what needs more bolstering, more nourishment, more actualization. And the negative, what are you going to do about it? As I said, different ways that you can harness it. Just getting a picture like that, a snapshot of your psyche through the eyes of the temperaments is alone a tremendous revelation. But of course the goal is action. And you'll be surprised. Once you begin the journey, it may sound daunting. You know, we all say the more things change, the more they stay the same. I'm, you know, I'm not in a place where I can really do new things. I'm a, become sluggish, I've become, I become uh, locked in my certain habits and routines. It's not the case. You have all the temperaments at your disposal that will help you grow. Bring in a good support system, friends that motivate, friends that are motivated themselves. Don't allow yourself to surround yourself with those that just reinforce your negative self-image or your sense of too late for me, I'm too old. That's not the case. Your spirit is always alive. Doesn't matter how, how, what mood you're in. Even if you're in a state of earthy melancholy. It's alive, waiting for you to access it. Like a pilot flame. And when you have that confidence, like in any type of challenge, you enter with confidence, you fight the battle a lot more secure in knowing that you can achieve your goals. Actualize your great potential. It's time to sing our song. It's time to sing your song, your unique contribution, your unique skills of making your corner of the world a brighter place, a gentler place, a more loving place. So much of our time is consumed with fighting demons, with fighting darkness. We don't even realize how much. And it can be exhausting, draining. 
it's time to begin to focus on the offense of what you have within you, the strengths you have within you. And that comes with that awareness that we're discussing. So here we conclude this four-part series, the four elements within you, fire, water, air, and earth. All of us have all four. The question is what's dominant, what's recess- recessive, and how much can we do to actualize each of these different temperaments and make them work together and complement each other. Because the deeper you go into it, the more you see how they're really all part of one larger picture, you. The beautiful, majestic spirit that you are with the unique music and song that you need to sing to actualize yourself and to make us all richer and more powerful people ourselves. Like that orchestra, the cosmic symphony each of us needs to play our songs our music we all are indispensable and necessary and at the same time need everyone else so may you be blessed with the courage with the strength with the support to look into your own heart and soul and discover the best part of who you are actualize and become the best you can be this is Simon Jacobson, Meaningful Life Center, MeaningfulLife.com, where you can find a wide array of resources that help you do exactly that. That's what we provide and offer. Tools, resources, skills, methodologies to help you become the best you can be, to help you learn to serve a higher cause, and to use your fire, water, air, and earth in the best possible way. Please don't hesitate to contact us, to share with friends, to comment. We thrive on that. We feel we are all partners in this. So please join us in this journey, this individual and collective journey of transforming our lives and this very earth, this very world into a beautiful spiritual home, a garden where people's uniqueness shine forth and all complement each other in one grand, beautiful, cosmic symphony.